For decades, the world lived in fear of nuclear war. There were several near misses, such as the Cuban Missile Crisis. But just six years before the Cold War ended, we reached its most dangerous point. A series of NATO exercises so spooked the Soviets that nuclear war almost began in late 1983. Today we will learn about how the Able Archer exercise nearly led to the end of the world. This is Knowledge Voyage. The Cold War hinged on the idea of mutually assured destruction. This states that whilst both superpowers had nuclear weapons, the first to use them would be attacked in retaliation and both countries would be destroyed. As a result, the chance of one country launching a quote, first strike was extremely low. This had the strange effect of keeping both powers equally poised and restrained. But by the early 1980s, that balance was about to change. New weapons and technology were being introduced all the time. Most scary of all was the American Pershing-class missile. The missile could be fired from bases in Western Europe and could hit Moscow in just six minutes. This would leave no time for the Soviet leaders even to make it to their secret bunkers. At least American ICBM missiles launched from the Midwest would take 35 minutes to arrive and allow at least some time to reach the bunkers and launch a retaliation. Further adding to their fear was the Star Wars program. This program suggested the US would soon be able to intercept Soviet missiles in space. Most of the Cold War had been based on the idea both sides had the equal ability to destroy each other. Star Wars meant the US could theoretically launch a dreaded first strike and then shoot down any Soviet missiles fired in response. The main pillar of mutually assured destruction, that both sides were equally in danger of the other, could soon be gone. The Soviet leadership began to believe that given the technological gap between them and the United States, they might have to prepare a preemptive first strike on America before Star Wars came online. In 1982, Leonid Brezhnev died after a long illness and was replaced by Yuri Andropov. Andropov was a hardline communist, even by the standards of the Soviet leadership. In the 1950s, he had been the Soviet ambassador to Hungary and had encouraged a hard crackdown on Hungarians during the 1956 uprising. Andropov had similarly encouraged and applauded the ruthless crushing of Czech protesters by Soviet troops in the 1968 Prague Spring. A man with this cold-hearted attitude to life was now in charge of a country teetering into unstable paranoia. This paranoia would be stoked up mercilessly by a United States military that was now pulling ahead in terms of technology and tactics. Ronald Reagan had been elected on a ticket of confrontation in the Cold War, and billions in today's dollars had been spent on equipment modernization. This included building futuristic weapons like the F-117 Nighthawk stealth fighter, introduced in 1981. With its intimidating sharp angles, it looked like something fresh out of science fiction, and was almost invisible to radar. This just added to the despair and fear of the Soviets. The Americans were also regularly engaging in daring flights into Soviet airspace. US planes would fly undetected into Soviet territory, turning on their radar reflectors and then suddenly pulling out of Soviet airspace before MiG fighters could intercept them. It wasn't just the Air Force that was spooking the Soviets. In 1983, the US Navy slipped undetected into Soviet waters in the Kamchatka Peninsula and then launched a mock attack on the Zeleny military base. Within the USSR itself, internal security seemed to be breached by the West. French intelligence had infiltrated the Soviet security forces and learned of how to sabotage the Soviet energy network. A three kiloton blast on a pipeline was blamed on Western sabotage. This combination of sudden explosions in Soviet oil lines, US planes and ships that seemed to appear from nowhere, and the near possibility of the Soviet nuclear arsenal being made redundant by Star Wars stoked the fears of paranoia higher. In 1983, Soviet leader Andropov could take it no more. At a secret meeting of KGB agents, he launched Operation Ryan. Ryan, which comes from the Russian letters for nuclear rocket attack, was set up with one task to search for evidence of American plans to launch a preemptive nuclear first strike. KGB spies all over the world were told to look out for even the smallest sign. This included reporting back lights being on late at night in Western government buildings. This was assumed to be war planners working late, but it never occurred to them it may just have been the cleaners. Many KGB agents felt Operation Ryan was a waste of time. The East German intelligence agency, the HVA, was one of the best communist spying agencies, and even they felt it was unlikely the Americans were planning a first strike. But in the Soviet bloc, no one questioned the leader. Furthermore, agents who made regular reports were more likely to be praised and promoted. This created the dangerous incentive for KGB agents to exaggerate, creatively interpret, or even just fabricate events in the West and feed it back to Moscow. This would all appear to Andropov that there was indeed signs of planning and that his paranoia was justified. The temperature of the Cold War got even hotter on September the 1st, 1983. That night, a Korean Airlines flight was flying from Anchorage, Alaska to Seoul in South Korea. But for reasons that are still not fully clear, it flew 150 miles off course. Instead of flying over the Pacific, it crossed the Kamchatka Peninsula, the same peninsula US forces had ruthlessly penetrated and provoked a few weeks earlier. 
On the ground, Soviet radar operators sounded the alarm. Since the American mock attack, the Soviet Air Force had been placed on high alert for intruders. Radar had also detected an incoming US spy plane under the Cobra Ball program, and it now looked like a US spy plane was rendezvousing with a mysterious intruder coming from Alaska. Further adding to the fear was this rendezvous was converging on the Petropavlovsk base. The Soviets scrambled MiG fighters, and whilst interceptors were often sent up, this time was different. The pilot was told to arm and test his weapons, as if he was soon going to be asked to use them. After a discussion with Soviet radar operators, he was ordered to shoot down the plane. He did, and all 269 people on board, including Georgia Congressman Larry MacDonald, were killed. Unknown to the Soviets, their radio communications were being listened to by a US secret base at Mishiwa in Japan. The recordings were released and public anger against the Soviets was elevated. But as sensitive as this incident was, things would get even hotter. Just three weeks after the airliner shootdown, Soviet soldier Stanislav Petrov was monitoring the nuclear attack warning radar. He had just been involved in writing the software for this warning system, and he knew better than most its potential weaknesses. And on the night of September the 26th, 1983, the alarm at the facility roared into life, as red signs on screen flashed, launch, launch, launch. The base went into full alert and panic, believing the Americans had finally launched their expected first strike, but Petrov believed the alarm software must be malfunctioning. He ordered the software to be rebooted, and to his horror, the alarm blared into life again. But this time, a new, even more menacing message was flashing on screen. Missile attack. Missile attack. Petrov now had a decision to make. Would he obey orders and phone the Soviet leaders for permission to launch an all-out nuclear attack that would end life on Earth? Or would he wait and trust his judgement this was a false alarm? He decided to wait, and the alarm stopped soon afterwards. It later emerged the alarm had been triggered by a solar flare that had caused a Soviet warning satellite to send a message to the software interpreted as an attack. Had Petrov not shown calm, or someone less acquainted with the software's weaknesses being on duty that night, the world may have been wiped out. The final period of tension in 1983 was Operation Able Archer. This was the codename for a NATO exercise that would simulate an all-out nuclear war. Over the course of several days, war gamers would be faced with a scenario of a Soviet preemptive attack and would test their responses. To make the exercise seem more realistic, conflicting information, as would occur in a real-life chaotic combat situation, would be fed to planners at NATO headquarters as well. For the Soviets listening in, this sounded terrifying. Their KGB spies had spent months compiling evidence that the Americans were about to strike. They had also detected an unusually high amount of radio traffic between London and Washington. They didn't realise this was because of the Falklands War and the US invasion of the former British colony of Grenada. At the same time, they had also detected heightened alert warnings at the US military bases. They didn't realise this was a precaution after the US Marine barracks in Beirut were bombed. This was all believed to be further signs of a preemptive strike. The most dangerous moment of Able Archer was the moment when war gamers drilled requests to launch nuclear weapons on the Soviet Union, and at this moment, the radio signals were changed. The Soviet listeners were now in a panic. Whilst all NATO combat exercises began with the messages, exercise, 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 this meant nothing. The Soviets had their own plan for a surprise attack that would be disguised initially as an exercise. They had every suspicion that NATO had a similar plan, which may also be disguised as an exercise. In East Germany and Czechoslovakia, combat aircraft were now ordered to be placed on the runway, engines flaming and told to be wait for orders to attack. Meanwhile, KGB agents entered Soviet nuclear bunkers to ensure that if an order to launch came in, the base staff would carry it out. In the Soviet Union itself, Soviet leader Yuri Andropov was handed the nuclear football and waited for further developments. He would spend all night waiting. It would soon become clear that this was indeed an exercise, and Able Archer came and went. For NATO, it had been a success, building on their successes earlier that year when over 80 ships from different NATO nations managed to get their ships into the Arctic Sea undetected. 1983 had come and gone. It had seen a highly provocative incursion to Soviet airspace by Americans. It had seen a civilian aircraft carrying a US congressman shot down by the Soviets. It had seen an alert to launch nuclear missiles given that turned out to be a malfunction. It had seen intelligence reports flow in that seemed to confirm a first strike was imminent. It had seen a high-level military exercise that seemed to fit the pattern of a preemptive strike. But thankfully, it was all over. The missiles remained unused in their bunkers and the world was not wiped out. But if cooler heads had not prevailed or the many incidents and misinterpretations had gone differently, maybe the world would never have made it to 1984. Thanks for watching everyone. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Thank you.